Okay, so how, how has the One Pipe journey been? So you came into One Pipe with this first product idea, which was basically to create I one instance and aggregate payments. Okay. Uh, obviously, One Pipe has evolved yeah. beyond that. So what has the evolution process been like? What problems are you currently solving or have you been able to solve? So as you know, for most startups, it's a journey of trying to find your footing and a place in the market. Yeah. So original thesis, aggregate payments. Let's go. Um, change to aggregate payments for large enterprises. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Change to, if you're going to aggregate payments for large enterprises, they seem to seem to have a better relationship with their banks than some random startup. Yeah. Okay, create a white label aggregated payment gateway for banks so that they can sell it to their large corporates. So mm -hmm. we got our first customer, SunTrust Bank. We basically took the entire one pipe, one pipe platform then and rebranded it as something for SunTrust yeah. to push. Then, as that was taking time, uh, we started getting demand from fintechs saying, well, I just want an API that does X, Y, Z or that does A, B, C. Mm -hmm. I don't need payment gateway. Mm -hmm. uh, and X, Y, Z or A, B, C are services that, that are bank specific. Exactly. exactly. That are bank specific. Mm. Well, oh, if that's the case, banks have access to some of these services for yeah. being a bank. Yeah. So let's quickly readapt one pipe to be a bit more loose. Like any interface we can take mm -hmm. as long as there's an underlying entity it, that yeah. can fulfill it. Okay. So yeah. we created like our own one pipe standard. Uh, an array of about 60 services. It was to us, we used to joke that this is open banking before open banking comes. So we created like a standard. It always looks like this. There, any provider you are, mm. if you conform to this standard, we can sell it. Yeah. Uh, we then started, of course, we we're too small to be telling people to build to some standard. So we we'll take people's APIs and retrofit it to meet our standard and expose it on the other side. Wow. So it went from payment gated aggregation, white label for a bank, to API aggregation, what level for a bank, where fintechs are the customers. We also learned a hard lesson. Uh, fintechs are always shopping around. It's just what it is. They are always shopping around. They're always looking to disintermediate and go closer to the metal. Yes. So you, we struggled convincing people that it pays you to integrate to this standard mm -hmm. and let us do the underlying work. work. Because they always actually be an access bank. I'll go and talk to access bank myself. So after a while, we concluded that chasing the fintech market, we will constantly be chasing our tail mm -hmm. and trying to earn our place at the table. Yeah. But if people are saying bank, 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 could we just get more bank APIs and then don't go after fintechs anymore? Go after traditional businesses who also need those bank APIs for whatever scenarios mm. matter to them, mm. but have the tech disadvantage so that you can actually have some measure of influence. So when they Manufacturer, for example, tells you, I'm always doing so much cash handling. How do I solve it? If your solution is call this API from this bank, combine with that one, and then offer credit from some other place, if, if that's your solution, they will look at you with blank eyes. Like, yeah. What are you really saying? <laughs> but if FinTech will tell you, I, yeah, okay, I get it. Mm. I know what I need to do. Mm. So we wanted those type of traditional companies where we will propose the solution and we'll be responsible for implementing the solution. And then that took us to how many banks can we quickly get mm -hmm. to service these types of use cases. By the time we got to bank four, we also made a hard call not to chase banks anymore. Like with four partner banks, you are really good. Yeah. You can be creative enough yeah. with the solutions you are giving people. So that's how we landed where we are now, making it possible for non-financial institutions, particularly traditional in nature, to offer financial services to their own customers as some way to improve the workflows or retention between them and their customers. Okay. And this takes us to what we call embedded finance. Right. Um, talking about embedded finance. So, yes, it's all well and good that, you know, a mom and pop store wants to use their POS to offer more services to their customers mm -hmm. or they want to, they want their customers to open a line of credit or some other things to their mm -hmm. customers. The question, though, is in this part of the world, is it a function of the products, the banking products that are not available or that the banking products are not reaching the masses? The right people. I think it's both. Okay. Um, I will use allergy as an example, the popular allergy. There's a level of banking relationship that allergy gets from the big banks. Yeah. We have a new refinery coming up. 
finance it. Banks will run around, try to participate in yeah. that project. But to participate in that project, banks will do some due diligence. Mm -hmm. They'll get their own project managers together, understand the refinery industry, it is it. They will before they push ahead with financing. Mm -hmm. But Allergy can get that. He can get them in a room and say, go work out the understanding of I my want. business. Mm -hmm. right. Now, if you bring that down to the mom and pop shop, I have a barbing salon mm -hmm. down the road. Ten people come to bar their head every day. I need to buy a second clipper, for example. Something as simple as that. I just yeah. need a second clipper. But I need the money that I'm making to feed myself. So, but you know I'm good for the clipper. Mm. Right? The only person you can discuss that with to finance that clipper is the person who knows that you have a barbing salon yes, and yeah, you're getting you 10 want, customers yeah. a day. You can't walk to your account office and explain how 10 customers come to bab their hair. Mm. What does that mean? <laughs> right? So, the, in that case, from a manufacturing perspective, like manufacturing or financial services perspective, yes. you need to redesign the financing for that baba to match the information you have available, which I is did. not bring your bank statements. Mm -hmm. That's one. So you need to redesign the product that you are giving me. Number two, do you even know the Baba is down the road? Right? That takes us to the distribution problem. Yes. No, but this Baba belongs to some association. So does the Baba even know that he can that come he can, to Exactly. You? So it's both a creation or manufacturing problem and a distribution problem. And they are kind of intertwined. Mm. And because it's early days, we are mostly offline in this part of the world. Yeah. means that there's a lot of offline work that needs yeah, to happen for this thing to then come to the surface but the interesting part is that it is happening already mm -hmm. not that it was happening offline in some yes. way it's just how to digitize it. and i'll give you a practical example i went to visit some distributor deep in yaba and like just before we kicked off into the fmcg movement mm. like describe the business to me yeah i'm like oh i normally buy this carton at 3007 mm -hmm. i sell it to my wholesaler at 3,800, I imagine, mm. no problem. Mm. But I know that that wholesaler is selling it to the beer parlor very close to me mm -hmm. at 4,003. Mm. But it tells the beer parlor, don't worry, I'll come and collect my money in seven days' time. That's what he does. The beer parlor doesn't mind because he's passing the cost down, down by the bottle yes. to the person. The distributor doesn't want to get involved in that messy work. So he says, I'll just give it to you that I know at mm -hmm. 38. You go sell it however you see best. Then we ask this distributor, would you be willing to give it to that beer parlor yourself at 3.9 if we pay you? <laughs> if you pay me, why not? I will take care of it. As long as but between you and the, the beer parlor to figure out how, how you, you get your yeah. money back. So already, inventory financing was happening in an informal way. Yeah. And the risk was priced in a way that put the beer parlor at a disadvantage and creates price distortion for the original manufacturer. Mm -hmm. But the effort to go in there to talk to the distributor, talk to the retailer, talk to the, the sub distributor himself, even understand the to capture it, is not banking work. Yeah, it's definitely you know, no bank, no account of the But work. actually, it's not. I, I I don't agree that it's not banking work because that's actually the core of banking. The core of banking is supposed to literally make people's financial lives better. Would you rather finance allergy? <laughs> Well, One transaction <laughs> <laughs> without Wala or okay. retaining 10,000 of the Well, there, there, is, there is that. So I feel like there's, there's a lot that education and exposure also mm. contributes to with regards to um, access to, to financial solutions. Because so, you know, these bear parlors and others that, you've ex uh, that you just talked about, for instance, a lot of these people don't even know that they are able to walk into a bank and request for Correct. certain services. Correct. So, in whose interest is is making um, marrying this value chain in the long run? Is it in the interest of the bank, or is it in the interest of the end user or the fintech who is providing the service? I think it's in the interest of everybody. Of course, that's the politically correct answer. To <laughs> But in all cases, when there's an when there's inefficiency in a market, yeah, it is the constructors of that inefficiency that lose when efficiency comes in. That's okay. really what happens all yeah. the time. Yeah. So in this case, a bank that is financing a large several millions of dollars mm -hmm. could finance an MFB instead with if possible the same amount of money. Of, yes. or, yeah. Instead, and this MFB will go deal with the mess mm -hmm. and service the financing that was provided, yeah. right? The bank has gained. You have still taken care the of that interest, portfolio. Yes. Yeah, you've still done what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So you gain because your business is kind of expanding. Mm -hmm. The MFB is fine because they have more liquidity to do what they need to do now. The beer parlor is fine because this thing I used to collect at 4.3 before. You see, they are giving me at 3.9 now. Awesome. Now that I'm getting it at 3.9, if I'm not greedy, I, I can stop sell selling both exactly. at 400 and do 3.50. Exactly. The manufacturer is therefore happier. Mm -hmm. My price distortion is, has, is, is, fixed. is almost fixed. But then somebody just got the short end of the stick. Uh, it's better we don't know who that person is today. But whoever was giving the carton to the dear fellow at four three, the, 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 the <laughs> man. yeah. So like you, like you keep saying, as long as everybody is not greedy, there's yeah. enough to go around. But, but to even be fair, we talked to some of these supposed middlemen. Yeah, and we're like, surely you had to pay the distributor. Mm -hmm. Yes, I had to pay. Mm, so but then you don't get your money from this guy. That's why you price it. Like, mm. Yes. What if I pay the distributor on your behalf and mm -hmm. just tell you don't oversell too much to yeah. this guy? Does that work? But you still help me chase down the guy to make sure he pays. They like it. So effectively, if you are making a margin of 600 Naira per credit with, with credit risk, mm -hmm. now your margin is down to 300, but you sold the credit risk to yes. the MFB. Then you're happy. Why not? Yeah, why not? Okay. That's, that's a very interesting way to look at it. Okay, so does this describe your grassroots banking product? Correct. So this is the at the core of grassroots banking. So the principle of grassroots banking, we're playing with the name now, I want to call it benefit banking. Sorry. <laughs> the play with it is within a value chain, if you introduce a bank account in there, mm -hmm. If you find some way to get people to digitize their cash via that bank account somehow, that way is the is the hard work today. Mm. But if you find some way for them to digitize that money, let it just pass through their account somehow. Can you therefore get the provider of that account to underwrite credit to create savings plans that match their behavior within that scope? So that's today what grassroots banking is. So we allow manufacturers, for example, to provide accounts to their distributors, provide mm -hmm. accounts to the downlines after the distributor. We deploy human beings to teach these retailers. I see this account that you just got. You can just stop by that POS agent and use it to pay your wholesaler or distributor when you want to pay for stuff. When you do that, we move the money immediately in and out to the distributor, but you have created a trail yeah. with which we can have a discussion with the MFBs that we work with. Say, this guy is moving X cartons a day, right? All you just have to do is this cash you just collected, mm -hmm. stop by that POS, pass it through the system. The next time your, your credit is coming, you'll be told, should be you don't want to pay now? And mm -hmm. the answer will be yes, and you'll be fine. So that's the thesis around grassroots banking. And this is just one example in FNC. We've mm -hmm. seen the same thing in agriculture. There are farmers in the north today who their harvest is coming six months' time. Mm -hmm. But then there's a supplier, there's a buyer that gives them imputes. As long as you commit to sell to that uh, buyer mm. at the end of the season, if you are going to give me half of the rice you are producing, it's on me. When you need uh, irrigation to support you, when you need uh, fertilizer to support you, right? But I can only do that when I have, I've come to your farm. I've seen that you are doing the right thing. Yeah. The buyers do that, right? Since they're already doing that, can I tell the buyer stop handing cash to the and there's insecurity. Stop handing cash to the guy. Pay it into that account that you give him, mm -hmm. and you can always go withdraw it because you're passing it through that. We will tell the MFB that this buyer doesn't need to be funding this farm. Would you like to fund the farm? Okay. So these 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 accounts that um, you create through the grassroots banking process, well, benefits banking now, is is not a virtual account. It's not a temporary virtual account. It's a full. It's real. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. It's an actual bank account yeah. that sits in a bank. To spare you all the details, but we do interesting things like because it's an actual bank account in a bank that is unknown, yeah. it's an MFB. Okay. Because it's unknown, at times it helps for brand recognition to attach the virtual account of our commercial partner banks to it. Oh. So you can tell the farmer you have a fidelity account. Mm -hmm. But it's not really a fidelity account because the deposit sits with the MFB. Yeah. But if he likes the name fidelity, tell him it's fidelity. Mm. If he likes the name Polaris, tell him it's Polaris. But the value still sits with the MFB that holds it. Okay. And if he doesn't mind the MAB, no problem now. Your account will support microfinance bank of this year. Is grassroots banking the same as agency banking? Or what's the difference? I haven't thought about it this way before. Well, if I'm on the spot, I'll say, let's say grassroots banking is agency banking 2.0.
in a sense. Today, most of the agents you see, and it doesn't matter who you talk to, mm -hmm. offer two primary services, cash in, cash, in, cash, cash out. That's it, right? Why does it need to stop there, right? Can an agent offer cash in, cash out, loans, yes. deposit, savings, mm -hmm. etc.? Can the cash that is going in be recorded on behalf of the guy who brought mm. it, not on behalf of the of agent? The agent. Because if it's recorded on behalf of the guy who brought it, then now he has a digital you trail exactly. that is useful, right? So in my view, and we also deploy agents today, but they don't do cash in, cash out. Like exactly. if you give money to agents of any of our MFBs today, they're taking that money, putting it into the same account that is yours. And if you were owing somebody, we already have like concept like mandates sitting around on the account that will sort out the payment, but that money has passed through. Mm. If you were taking a loan, it will credit that same thing. When the agent wants to give you your loan, it's coming out of the account that was credited. So you have, it's yours. So the difference I see is that when you go to a classic agent, mm -hmm. you hand over your cash, it does something. And yeah, you're out of but the loan. exactly. When you go to any of our MFB's agents, it if you hand over your cash, for it's, you. it's for you. Then that is like you have an account. At some yeah. point, we hope you will ask, can't I use this account for myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's, that makes a lot of sense and solves a lot of the identity and credit Correct. issues that Correct. we have. Correct. Okay. So when you started one pipe, there was a vision. The vision was we are going to aggregate payments or we're going to aggregate financial mm. transactions. How did you decide on because obviously it wasn't it wasn't a one size fits all thing and it wasn't one service that you wanted to provide. So of the array of services that you wanted to provide, how did you prioritize? How did you decide what happens first? All right. Hmm. So, when I was chronicling the journey yeah. from aggregated payments, white label payments, yeah. APIs Large from fintechs, etc. Mm. So, when we were in that fintech mode, when we were in that mode where we wanted fintechs to be our customers, yeah. The demand was high for two things. People wanted to look into the bank accounts of people in every bank. So mm. fintechs want to be able to say, I can take money from a bank account in as frictionless way as possible across all banks. So mm. that was one area of demand. The second was people wanted to be able to, for those, especially those in lending and PFMs, they're able to pull statements out of all the 20 something yeah. banks. We are tempted to go down that path. He led us talking to almost 20 banks at the same time. Again, we got humbled. No one talks to 20 something banks yeah. and comes out without gray hair. So, one of the things that actually helped us decide to stop picking fintechs as our customers was then when we found out that, but when we talk to traditional companies, they are not this specific and broad. Mm. Like, specific as by I want statement from mm. 20 banks, mm. which is broad. Mm. They are a bit more, well, if you can clear the cash that is coming to my warehouse, I'm fine. Yeah. So we're like, okay, if you look at the we have five partner banks, it works in a particular way. Is there an, a mixture of APIs from this one, this one, this one that eliminates this cash problem for this guy? If we eliminate this cash problem from this guy, is there a lending partner that can say, ah, well, I'm ready to do mm. credit now? When we did that bit of introspection, we realized that we actually don't need all 20 banks anymore. One or two good lenders, one or two good banks, some operational work on the ground. The cycle is complete. So we prioritized on APIs for account opening. Because we open those accounts and we operate them, then we can do everything on the account, things, credit, yes. debit, whatever you need mm -hmm. to do on the account. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to open accounts in 20 banks. You don't need to convince the manufacturer that ah, this is the bank that we are working yeah. with, Chemak mm Babet. -hmm. Once they say yes, we are home and dry. So we as just long as it works, they're fine. Exactly. Who is your target customer today? Manufacturers. Agro value chain, okay. like buyers, people that do that buy from farmers, yeah. uh, distributors themselves. Okay. And these days we have a few airlines that we are working with. Oh, interesting. What do you do with airlines? Virtual accounts for payments. Oh. That then leads to credits to finance your next trip, mm. as long as you are loyal to that airline. Makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm like using my cash to buy my Exactly. House. Exactly, exactly. Nice. Okay. I see that in all of these, none of them is a tech company. Well, exactly. they're all tech well. enabled, but yeah. yes. They're not going to start integrating to some bank. Uh, yeah, they're not even interested. Yeah, they're not interested. <laughs> are you selling tickets? Are you not selling? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs>
Which, because, so, you know, you're positioning yourself to be able to solve problems for people who can't solve it, not for people who have, have options. A, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so what was your approach to acquiring these customers that you mentioned? Our partner banks have been most helpful. Okay. Um, and I think it was one of the best places that has worked out well. Like, these businesses a banking relationship with some bank already. Exactly. There's some credibility there. When a bank comes in and says, hey, I can now. Yeah. So we found that to be very helpful. Like a lot of our customers came in through the bank channel. That's one. But then once it starts to get bespoke and mm. need some more thoughts, mm. some more engagement, some of those banks pass them to us and say, I don't know what these people are really saying. Please go and meet them and understand what they are saying. In those scenarios, then we take on those relationships by ourselves. Okay. Then our investors have been super helpful. Like they send customers to us. Mm. Then, as you know, customer leads to customer. Yeah. If you do something well for a nice guy, mm. for a guy nicely, he tells you, ah, okay, there's sort there's of thing. One, yeah. Okay. Makes sense. So from the inception of one pipe, let's focus on one pipe now. So now, how would you say your marketing spend has been? Like in the beginning, how much were you spending on marketing? You know, just ballpark. Almost non existent. Interesting. Like, if I tell you that our entire marketing spend in the last one year is less than 200k, like, ah, dollar strap. Oh. Ah. Because I'm thinking, fact, from inception, how is that possible? like from inception, okay. like less than 200k, it sounds weird. But I know it's debatable. Like, people will say, yeah. That's not the right thing to be. As opposed to spend money, but then it depends the, on the kind of service you're so, providing. Exactly. So we were like, okay, one, like you said, who are our customers? Mm -hmm. What kind of marketing can reach them? What kind of message will get them to give us that meeting? Yeah. Which is really what we're looking yes. for. Give us that meeting yeah. and give us that attention for two, three months. Like, what what would drive that? We concluded that the typical spending marketing won't do it. It'll be like mm -hmm. spending work on money on brand building. When you are not yet known and you don't have a few reference points to point to, could be weak. Like buying Google ads when nobody exactly. knows you. Exactly. So, first build out a customer base that is loyal, that is happy. Yeah. Then help the partner banks that you are working with to announce their own products. We give those banks the power to then engage the customers mm -hmm. on your behalf. Now, once you have a reasonable base, then you can say a little bit more about yourself. Like, that's the approach we took. And then, like, before we decided to start deploying money on anything comes, we've been studying, there's some article I found around how Elon Musk has a marketing approach when you are using, when you're in a new category, mm. that you should deploy your capital, not preaching yourself, but preaching the category, mm. right? So if embedded finance is the thing, and people are still just trying, what's so this thing? So become a thought leader. Yeah, so promote the concepts with little emphasis on yourself. Mm. If you are promoting the concept with little emphasis on yourself, it then means how do you promote such a thing? It's not billboard. Billboard don't really do it, right? So it's things like sponsoring events, gathering top leaders to your room yeah. and explaining the things to them. These things don't cost as much as the normal ATL you are seeing mm. everywhere. So we chose that approach and, said, and we retained a PR firm okay. that then put a plan together for us to execute on that. And that's what we've been running since February. Okay. Yeah. So, so far, that's cheaper. It gives us the credibility. We need to close out some of our pending customers. Mm -hmm. And then we think on the back of that, we can then do more. But again, like another guy we have used to say, when the facts change, it may mean, it may mean that there's a need to be a bit more adventurous in communicating. Yeah. We may or we may not. But for now, what we are doing, we think, is yes, what we working. should be doing at this stage yeah. that we're in. Okay. Okay, so you talked about how your partners have been very helpful with customer acquisition. Um, how about on other perspectives, things like uh, licenses and certifications? Uh -huh. So in fact, it, like it's, it's been helpful on many fronts. So at the beginning, you are just one pipe, right? Why should anybody deal with you? Yeah. When I say, no, I'm not really one pipe. But just the tech for Polaris Bank. Oh, okay. So it's Polaris Bank we're dealing with. And then that brings people in, they're a bit more comfortable. So essentially, we were leveraging the license of the banks that we yeah. worked with. Okay. Then recently, we got our own PSSP AIP, which is nice to have, but hasn't changed much. You're like, okay, so you have it. Mm. As, you reduce, as you increase the customers coming to you because of it, no. Mm -mm. 
are they coming in less through the banks because of it? No. So I think the right set of partner banks will give you the cover you need, yeah. the shield you need, and they, they defend you. Like every time a new bank is going like, they get the CBN to give them their own no objection. Like it's really like the bank's product. And we're just like the Intel inside yeah. behind the scenes. So I think that has been helpful. But once we get our final uh, PSSP, maybe we'll be a bit more adventurous and communicating direct to the market. Maybe it's necessary, maybe it's not. We'll see. So impute. Um, Texas is an accelerator. Correct. And you went through that process of applying and all. Um, how was that process? What was it like for you? Was that the first accelerator you applied to? Yeah, the first okay. and only. Okay. So uh, First, why did you choose an accelerator as against a, an investor? Was there any reason behind it? I think even up until the point where we applied, I wasn't convinced that I wanted to go down this path. Okay. You know, there's that old traditional company and startup. Yeah. I think I was more of a traditional like guy than startup. But we needed money, we needed support, we needed the things we needed. Yeah. And if traditional path is taking too long, maybe the startup path would work. So up until that point, even I still wasn't convinced we should do it. But then one of my uh, long-time supporters shows up and says, you really know that if you apply, you could get in. Like your numbers don't look bad. Your process looks clean. You're efficient. Your capital is clean. You really could apply. I wasn't convinced, but thank God for people like Yvonne, who was like, this thing this man is saying makes sense. Why are you not listening? Like, okay, if you can apply, you apply. Do the work. Do it now. <laughs> so she actually put it on herself, got everybody, got the relevant documents, did the things that needed to be done, applied. We got the interview and we were in. Till today for that, I'm very grateful for that choice. Like, I'm very grateful. So, to me, that was the only time we applied. That was the only application we managed to get in. And for me, that was like a a pivotal turning point for the entire one pipe job. Like, it just gave us breathing room. This, oh, are we paying salary next month? We're going to start the project. Just just died. Mm. We can now take time. And do things right and then we got a whole slew of supporters after that particularly you know once you go through an accelerator or an incubator there's the usual attraction so to speak that comes after now sexy. That. yes exactly <laughs> now sexy. Chris <laughs> so, oh, how how did you because i can imagine you were getting calls left right and center people wanted to bring in money and um, so how how did you align your how did you align one pipe's goals with all of those distractions and what was the next thing that you do how did you navigate through your next steps so one of the things we learned at texta that i'm again very grateful for don't take money you don't need like if you don't need it why take it mm. right especially when you are early because you are early mm-hmm. there's not enough empirical evidence to back any high valuation valuations you yes. come up with. and if you take way more money than you need your next rounds get harder because now your capital looks choked already. Yeah. So I took that away as a lesson. Like, okay, if we need to go for one year and go down this embedded finance path to even mm-hmm. prove that it's a thing, yeah. how much do you need? Like that money you need is what you should raise. Don't so once we locked down that, and I think we also got in discipline at some point. On our first round, we thought we needed 450k. We were clear we needed 450k. Mm. Then the calls came in and we ended up at 950. At some point, one of my mentors that I count on, Jenny at Texas, was like, if you don't stop this round now, I will be very angry with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't stop this thing now. <laughs> so, like, we kept taking checks. Then, but you don't need it. I think you should stop now. Yes. I'm like, okay, fine, 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 fine. We're stopping now. So, we stopped at 9 feet. So, I think that was one takeaway. That just don't take what you don't need. Yeah. And then, if you borrow from that, we found out that after you take the minimal you need and you prove to your next milestone, the next one would likely come yeah. as long as you push your numbers. So why raise big, have a big valuation that you now spend so long to earn? Mm. If you can do small, execute according to your plan, do again. Of course, they say it's debatable. In a market downturn, what if you don't find the next one? It is, it is. Mm. Well, so with the market correction that is happening now, where do you think that one pipe stands and how how do you think that you'd be able to come out on top 
Can I play Oma Omi for you? If you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the point, the, 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 the point is, so obviously we all know that, you know, nobody has a crystal ball. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. But based on One Pipe's current trajectory, what happens if, do you think that it's possible that there's a point you'll get to where you see the end of your runway based on the way the company is going right now? It's the fear every founder has. Like, a company dies when it runs out of money. That's yes. really what the company... Whether it's money you're generating from customers or money generated from it. But you die when you run out of money. So we're going to raise a round, or we consider raising a round early this year. Okay. Uh, I wasn't convinced that it was time. Most of the team wasn't convinced that it was time. But if people were like, the market is hot. If they are giving you, you take it. So we put our foot down and say, we're not, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. So we're not raising this round. And then we, and one then, of the things that helped me, this, and then this happened. So some of those people are saying, see, we told you, you should have taken it when you needed, when it was available, mm -hmm. even though you didn't need it. Mm -hmm. But then I remember what, again, people that I trust said to me, they were like, no, if you're a business that is doing well, if you are doing your job, mm -hmm. you won't have a problem yeah, exactly. in your next round. It will only become difficult if you made a promise of this, you took money because of this, mm -hmm. and, you're not and then you are not able to hit this. Then you had better take a lot of money yeah. so that you can keep trying to get this. Yeah. But if so far you are promised X, you are close to X, you will get your next one. And interestingly, we will likely be doing a round soon. Okay. And we already have enough interest towards that round, even though we have not said it's officially mm. open. And to me, that's just some element of that. Just do what you promise. Yeah. You will get what you need. Mm -hmm. So for me, if you are fundamentally correct as a business in that you're actually generating revenue and on your way to profit, there would always be that interest. It's yes and no, or okay. a mix of both. Because you will always have to balance the path to profitability with growth. Yeah. And depending on the appetite of the kind of investors you have, some would like to say if the market is big and you are sure it is big and there's mm -hmm. some kind of moat around it, mm -hmm. go for growth will do it. So yeah, that's what I mean. The, but that's risky. But it's risky, but the point is there's a there's a clear trajectory. It's not a situation of taking, I don't know, um, hundred million dollars and spending ninety, oh, like, oh, 90 million. Yes. No, but the people people do this today. People do, yes, and you see and people spend bloated, bloated marketing budgets. A lot of Employees expenses. That's, exactly. You know, be adding value. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So if you if you are able to continue to run lean, regardless of how much money you you raise, and okay. you know keep Agreed. on track, then it's a discipline that will exactly. suit you much later. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. In trying to find your fit as one pipe, trying to, you know, in pivoting and pivoting until getting to some formula. Yeah. <laughs> so to some level of, you know, product market fit, what what are a couple of things you would say have really stood out to you positively and negatively? Negatively will be on the personal front. Yeah. And I would say you will change. Like that one is now clear. If you thought you believed X, you say, are you sure it's not X minus Y? Mm. So that will happen. Uh, if I'm going back into this life again, this yeah. also life, it's now new information that I can hold. Like, don't beat yourself too much because you will change. Some things you thought you believed in, you will adjust it with mm. whatever reality is. Uh, uh, actually, so I don't know whether that's positive or negative. It's, it's <laughs> it make you question growth. your values. I said, mm. like you, you will. So that's one. Um, I would say again, you need money. Like it costs more. Things just cost money plus time. Like you need money and you need time. And at times, money buys time. I don't know that time buys money, Shah, but at times money no. buys time. <laughs> I don't think it's possible for time to buy money. Exactly. So but you can make money with time. Exactly. Maybe you can make money mm. with time. Exactly. So you will need money. Please plan with a bit more for science. Practical. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> plan I remember with... <laughs> remember that even if you are cutting your coat according to your clothes, something yeah, somebody can call exactly. you one day and say, Oh, somebody needs money exactly. somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Then I'm I've learned the the power of people. Like 
you can't say it too much now. Like, you can't oversay it. It is what it is. Like, you really can't do these things on your own. You need to have a handful of people around you that you can nearly absolutely count on. Yeah. And then those things you can't do, they do. When you are going the wrong way, they actually, Baba, don't be like that. Like, you need those kind of people around you. And they are rare and hard to find. But when you find you need to put in your absolute best. And, wow, this journey yeah, together. You're one of the trustees of um, the Open Technology Foundation that yeah. has been a major advocate for open banking in Nigeria. Yeah. Okay. Did that happen before one pipe or after one pipe? How did they feed into each other? I think it's before one pipe. Even before I left InterSwitch, they had always that circulated some stuff and like, do you want to support this also? But we're all not very serious. But yeah. So I think it's before. It's before yeah, before. it was. Mm, it was. So do you think that that was a major contributor to even the addition of your one pipe? Um... I think so. Okay. And I think there's a bit of overlap as well. So as I got deeper into the open banking thing, yeah, uh, a friend of mine, to Idris from Banso, showed up and said, oh, "Welcome. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. There's this thing called PSD two in Europe, and he opened his laptop and I ah." Bank can give this API. Bank can give this API. Bank. Are you sure? So it's all over Europe now. So those things help me shape that. Ah, if this thing exists, so many things become possible. Like yeah. so many things become near reality if it truly exists. So mm -hmm. I started digging deep. Uh, PSD two in Europe, open banking in the broader. So PSD two in UK, open banking mm -hmm. in the broader Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, UPI in India. So I started seeing this pattern. Like it's like this is some kind of movement. And when movements like that start, it almost always ends up coming and becoming mainstream. Yeah. It's just a matter of time now. Mm. So, as I looked at the PSD2 spec more at that time, ah, this big pipe thing you are doing, you probably need to broaden it. If this thing is truly coming, mm. you probably need to broaden this your pay pipe to be a bit more flexible and extend it. And then, as we started working more on Open Bank in Nigeria, and we're specking out what we think the standards could look like for Nigeria, to be fair, I borrowed from that. So I was involved in the specking for yeah. this one with it. So I was borrowing from that. Okay, you need to think about statements like this. You need to think about how does this bank operate mm. when it is financial versus flex queue. Let some of these things guide your principle. But as we looked, and the OTF one was a suggested spec yeah. for the CBN to look at. Mm. And okay, if there's a suggested spec and you're creating a spec for one pipe, the minimum you can do. Is to yes, try and prepare to for this thing that yeah. is coming out so that it doesn't catch you by surprise. Mm. So we designed one pipe spec to, to be as closely compliant to the suggested spec from OTF as possible. Uh, so that when the final thing comes out to us, on the you technical side, it'll be like a version increase exactly. on the API. And then. Okay. So what is next for one pipe? We need to find product market fits faster than we had scheduled. Again, because of market downturn. And I would have thought that you have found. Yeah, so you know these things in, is in stages. Okay. First, you are talking to a customer, and they're not really buying. Mm. You tweak, tweak, tweak. Till you are talking to the customer, and they are buying. Then, now that they are buying, how long does it take to start using, and then to start using consistently? So we're at that stage where convincing customers is now no longer the problem. Mm. Is now when is this this thing we're doing with this guy now? This integration that is taking so long. Yeah. When will it finish for them to fully adopt it to start generating value? Again, the larger market only cares about the things you can back with actual naira and cobo at the back. Mm -hmm. Actual naira and cobo is a lagging indicator to product market fit in a sense. You need to first win the customer. So up until Say a series A, for example, the market can forgive you for always telling soft stories. Yeah. Customers like it. See the customers in my top mm. of my pipeline. This thing is great. Mm. But starting near your series A. What's happening at the bottom? It's now what's line. happening at the bottom. This is where the efficiency of the yeah. bot, they went live, yeah. they are using, is yeah. generating money now becomes relevant. Okay. For me personally, my measure of product market fit is that bottom line. That that needs to happen before I, I can say yeah, what. The formula is, is correct. It's correct. So, I agree. So that's where we are heading towards. Okay. Okay. Thank you Thank so you much, much Okwe. It was great having this conversation with you. 
thank you for coming on Founders Who Dead. And thank you for daring and sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me.